All right, uh, let's go ahead and talk about the Congress of Vienna. Uh, after the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars, uh, in Europe, they, they decided that there were a lot of folks who were like, this is crazy. We have to get back to some form of stability. And that was really the purpose of the Congress of Vienna. They were looking to restore order, return to order in Europe after the chaos that was the reign of Napoleon. So how do they do that? Well, there's a couple different ideas out there floating around. Obviously, out of the Napoleonic era, you have the revolutionaries, the folks who are in favor of the French Revolution. They want change. They want it now. Uh, oftentimes, that's violent. It's immediate. Uh, then you also have liberals who are also in favor of change, but uh, and individual rights, which was the significant change from a, a monarchy. But they're willing to work a little bit more within a system. The moderates are kind of a combination of the two. They're like, well, we like the authority, but we also like a little bit of the idea about rights. And so they're kind of in the middle. Your conservatives are those who are like, you know what, we really like the authority, the monarchs. We like things the way they were. And then there's your reactionaries. They're the opposite end of the spectrum of the revolutionaries. The revolutionaries want to throw everything out and start over with everything new. The reactionaries want to take things back to the way they used to be. They want to turn the clock back 50, 100 years back to the good old days. And, and so that's the political spectrum that you have following the Napoleonic era. Those who were dramatically and, and exuberantly in favor of the French Revolution, those who despised the French Revolution and everything it was and who wanted to go back to the way things were. Uh, and so that's your political spectrum. And out of that, in around 1850, you get people coming to the Congress of Vienna. The Congress of Vienna takes place September 1814 through June of 1815. And it includes people from all over Europe. Uh, obviously, Vienna being the capital of Austria takes place in Austria, and all your major players are there. Austria, England, Russia, Prussia, and even France, uh, even after the defeat of Napoleon. Now, uh, Austria sends a representative of the government of Metternich. Uh, England sends Castlereagh. Uh, Russia, uh, Alexander I represents Russia and William III from Prussia. But probably, interestingly enough, one of the most significant guys at the Congress of Vienna was the guy from the losing side, the French. They, they lost. Napoleon was defeated. But Talleyrand shows up and is so skillful in the, with diplomacy that he's actually able to get France to come out looking pretty good, even after they had suffered a hugely significant defeat uh, at the hands of the rest of Europe. The rest of Europe gathered together to battle France and won. And France doesn't really lose that much out of the deal, which is absolutely remarkable. In fact, by the end of the thing, France is almost seen as an indispensable counterweight to, to Russia. Uh, and that is one of the reasons why France stays intact uh, throughout the Congress of Vienna and, in fact, comes out smelling pretty good, smelling almost not like a rose, but they're doing pretty good. So why do we have this? Why do we have the Congress of Vienna? Well, the major powers don't want another incident like the Napoleonic Wars. They want things to return to normal. They want things to be balanced and stable. They're looking to restore a balance of power, which is why France stays in the mix because they... They're one of the balances to Russia and Austria. We want all the powers to kind of be even so that they're not going to have in a situation where one thinks they can go ahead and run the table on all the others. Uh, they, they want to go ahead and restore legitimate governments, government that had, governments that had a history, governments that had uh, a, a clear, uh, a clear uh, claim to power. And in many cases, these are your, your monarchs. They're the ones who had ruled for a long time. They had uh, claims to power other than just the backing of a revolution. And so a lot of monarchies are getting restored out of the Congress of Vienna. Further, a lot of the countries that had fought these wars were looking for some sort of compensation from France. Hey, we just lost a lot because we had to pay a lot of money for these wars. We want you to buck up and, and give us something in return, and we're going to get to more of that in just a little bit. And they're looking for a peaceful means of settling a dispute. The Europeans don't want to plunge into another continent-wide war, and so they're looking for some way to provide a system where they could go ahead and avoid this. And that's one of the purposes of the Congress of Vienna, uh, to try to go ahead and set up such a system. And, you, and you'll see the, the fruits of that. The, the desire is there long after the Congress of Vienna. Uh, of course, World War One, and out of that, the League of Nations. World War II, out of that, the United Nations. All of those are kind of a similar trend where Europe is, is wanting to try to avoid these massive conflicts that they were getting themselves into. Uh, one of some of the major things that were concessions out of the Congress of Vienna, some of the major settlements, things that were decided upon. First, France has a monarchy back. Uh, they put the Bourbon uh, family back in there, the Bourbon monarchy, and Louis XVIII takes over. He becomes the king of France yet again. It's a constitutional monarchy, uh, but it's nonetheless he's the king of France. So king ha the, the French have a king again. Hereditary rulers are restored throughout Europe. 
whereas Napoleon had gone through and, and overtaken a lot of these uh, kings and deposed them, they were now put back on their thrones in Spain, in Holland, in Sardinia, uh, the two Sicilies, which is uh, su modern day southern Italy and Sicily, the island off the off the boot there, so to speak, um, where we have hereditary rulers restored back to their thrones. Uh, the compensation that is, is doled out here, uh, Russia gets land in Finland and gets part of Poland. Uh, Prussia also gets uh, some, some land along the Rhine, some of the German lands there. They get the remainder of Poland and, and a part in Western Germany called Saxony. Uh, England, England gets major concessions out of the deal. Uh, Malta, Ceylon, South Africa, which is enormous, but will eventually lead to uh, the Boer Wars because the original settlers were Dutch, now they're English, and that's a whole other ball of wax that comes along later. Uh, the West Indies, uh, so territory in the West Indies, Britain gains out of this. So Britain gets substantial concessions uh, and gets compensated uh, pretty handsomely for their role in the Napoleonic Wars. Holland, uh, Holland ends up on the losing side because they cooperated a lot with Napoleon. Uh, they lose Ceylon and South Africa uh, to, to Great Britain. Uh, Austria gets significant gains, especially in Italy, uh, up in the northern parts of Italy, uh, Lombardy, uh, Venetia, Modena, uh, Tuscany, Parma, some of those areas. Uh, they become they come under the rule of Austria. And, and all of this is undermined. Uh, the general sentiment at the Congress of Vienna is a general contempt for democracy. They view that as mob rule, no legitimacy. They have a contempt for nationalism. This is a monarchy. Uh, it's not a loyalty to a, a state or a constitution or a government, a nation like that, but rather loyalty to a monarchy and a disdain for liberalism. Without a doubt, the Congress of Vienna is very much a conservative, even bordering on reactionary type of movement, although they're very much influenced by some of the things that were started in the French Revolution. Uh, but uh, in large part, it's really a reactionary type of uh, response to the French Revolution. So what do you do once this happens? How do you maintain this balance of power? How do you enforce the peace that was developed by the Congress of Vienna? Uh, that's through a couple of different alliances. You have the Quadruple Alliance and the Holy Alliance. Uh, the Holy Alliance is really Prussia, um, uh, Russia, and, and um, Austria. Those are the three that come together. But they're all kind of, it's kind of lopsided over on Eastern Europe. And so in order to get the balance, they go ahead and bring in Great Britain, becomes part of the Quadruple Alliance. So the Quadruple Alliance is kind of like an add-on to the Holy Alliance. It's kind of um, one extra power in Great Britain uh, in, the, in the Quadruple Alliance. And those are really, that's really the, the means by which they try to go ahead and establish a balance of power with the, that alliance system. Uh, Europe becomes kind of obsessed for the next hundred years or so with alliance systems. And, and that's, you know, you see that in World War II, the Triple Alliance and the Triple Entente, these different alliance systems, and these idea of balancing each other out. Again, a balance of power to maintain peace. And, and you see you see that all the way, not only just through World War I and World War II, but, but even into the Cold War, where you have opposing sides that balance each other out.